Get ready for the excuses. For years now, those who have sounded the alarm over the dangers of gender-affirming pediatric treatment have been monstered as bigots, hateful, transphobic, and even fascist. Now their concerns have been entirely vindicated by the CAS review, and those most responsible for the monstering are already attempting to wriggle their way out of accepting responsibility. We can expect much more of this as further revelations come to light. Take Stonewall, the charity most culpable for spreading this toxic ideology. In a statement posted recently on X, it appeared to endorse the review's findings, even quoting approvingly Dr. Hilary Cass's plea to remember the children and young people trying to live their lives and the families, carers and clinicians doing their best to support them. What can one say about such serpentine sleight of tongue? Perhaps the actor James Dreyfus, one who has felt the full brunt of the wrath of gender ideologues, put it best when he wrote, the absolute fucking nerve of these people. Mermaid CEO Lauren Stoner is another in the running for the Brass Neck Award, appearing on Sky News to claim that We're not medical experts, we don't advocate for any pathway. Mermaids made the same claim in the tribunal it initiated in a failed attempt to strip LGB Alliance of its charitable status. And yet in leaked emails, it was discovered to have given advice to the now disgraced Gender Identity Development Service, JIDS, at the Tavistock Clinic. Most notably, Mermaids had offered support in the drafting of an NHS service specification. And Mermaids website currently claims that puberty blockers are an internationally recognized, safe, reversible healthcare option, even though there is mounting evidence of the dangers of these drugs. One of the findings of the CAS review is that there is no evidence for the efficacy of puberty blockers. Rather than being a pause in which young people can take time to figure out their gender identity, in almost all cases, they lead on to cross-sex hormones and, in some cases, irreversible surgery. During Stoner's interview for Sky News, she was also quick to remind us that Mermaids has been supporting trans young people and their families for nearly 30 years. What she neglected to mention is that until the arrival of former CEO Susie Green, a woman who took her son to Thailand on his 16th birthday to have him castrated, Mermaids actually offered sensible advice to parents of children who were struggling with their gender. A leaflet produced by the charity in the year 2000 is more in line with the watchful waiting approach favoured by many paediatric therapists. This is what it said. Gender identity disorders in infancy, childhood and adolescence are complex and have varied causes. In the majority of cases, the eventual outcome will be homosexuality or bisexuality, but often there will be a heterosexual outcome as some gender issues can be caused by a bereavement, a dysfunctional family life, or rarely by abuse. Only a small proportion of cases will result in a transsexual outcome. That even mermaids once held this position shows the extent to which gender identity ideology drives well-intentioned people away from the truth and a reminder that this belief system has taken hold remarkably quickly. Both Mermaids and Stonewall were mentioned by Tavistock whistleblower Dr. David Bell as being chiefly to blame for the current climate of making people afraid of even listening to another view. To this, we might add groups such as Gendered Intelligence, the LGBT Foundation, and the online Pink News, which has published defamatory pieces about those who have objected to the rise of this ideology. The irreversible surgical malpractice that has left many young people sterile and eliminated their sexual function can be put down to the intimidation that has been stoked by groups who claim to advocate for LGBT rights. And what are the private practices, those who evaded the NHS's recent ban on puberty blockers? Of course, there are financial and ideological incentives for these groups to dismiss the CAS review. And so we shouldn't be surprised that Dr. Aidan Kelly from private clinic Gender Plus appeared on Navara Media to argue that the evidence demanded by CAS is neither deliverable nor desirable. Host Michael Walker seemed to think that the figure of approximately 1,000 patients in 10 years prescribed puberty blockers was too low to merit concern and that some of these issues have been politicized in a way that they don't need to be. One wonders how many instances of testicular atrophy, increased risk of cancer, osteoporosis, or impaired brain development in healthy children should be considered acceptable. Why are we even countenancing ruining young people's lives through the unevidenced, experimental, and ideological medicalization of problems that almost certainly require a psychotherapeutic approach? 
Navara Media might want to start preparing its own excuses too, given that it published an article in December 2021 offering advice on how to deceive medical professionals in order to be prescribed opposite sex hormones. I'm not suggesting you tell any especially big fibs, the article says, but maybe finesse your story into one that's likely to be received with the least amount of confusion. And bear that in mind with the psychiatrist too. You're not here to make friends, you're here to get hormones. This kind of duplicity has been widespread. Dr. Hilary Cass has revealed to the British Medical Journal that children have been coached on what to say and what not to say in order to be prescribed puberty blockers. They're told not to say they're unsure about their sexuality, not to say they've been abused, because it's so high stakes at that point, she said. We have known for a long time that the overwhelming majority of children referred to the Tavistock were same-sex attracted, and that gender nonconformity in youth is a reliable predictor of homosexuality in later life. This has been confirmed in the final report by Dr. Cass, which found that 89% of girls and 81% of boys referred to JIDs were either homosexual or bisexual. The NHS has been practicing gay conversion therapy in plain sight. We also know that those who have been abused are disproportionately represented among the patients. One study cited in the final CAST report shows that one in five children referred to gender services have suffered sexual or physical abuse. In other words, rather than experiencing some kind of esoteric mismatch between body and gendered soul, most of these kids are simply gay or troubled. And yet they're being coached to lie about their actual problems to satisfy the expectations of ideologues. These people have snake oil to sell, and if a few children have to suffer, then so be it. Throughout the CAS review, the lack of evidence for all of these treatments is continually emphasized. The very notion of gender medicine is underpinned by the belief that we each have a gender identity, what Helen Joyce has described as something like a sexed soul. In this, she is supported by trans campaigners like Julia Serrano, who calls it a subconscious sex. Or the barrister, Robin Moira White, who on my show, Free Speech Nation, said it was an essence of male or female. This amounts to a faith in the supernatural and is a key doctrine of the new state religion of gender. It goes without saying that people are entitled to their beliefs, but the idea that a metaphysical hypothesis should form the basis of NHS practice is, on reflection, extremely bizarre. One of the reasons why this has been allowed to happen is that so many have been duped into accepting that this quasi-religion has some basis in science. This is largely down to the influence of WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, a body established in 1979 that is recognized as the leading global authority in this area and one that has pushed for the normalization of the gender-affirming approach. Its standards of care have formed the basis of policies throughout the Western world, including the NHS, and it is explicitly critiqued in the CAS review for its lack of developmental rigor. In early March, the credibility of WPATH was shattered when internal messages and videos which had been leaked to journalist Michael Schellenberger were made public. A full report was written by journalist Mia Hughes for the Environmental Progress Think Tank. It was called The WPATH Files, Pseudoscientific Surgical and Hormonal Experiments on Children, Adolescents and Vulnerable Adults. It revealed a general lack of ethical and professional standards. There are messages proving that surgeons and therapists are aware that a significant proportion of young people referred to gender clinicians suffer from mental health problems. Some specialists associated with WPATH are proceeding with treatment in the knowledge that no consent has been secured from either the children or those directly responsible for their well-being. They have also withheld from patients details of potential lifelong complications or continued down this path knowing that the children do not understand the implications. But then how could a prepubescent or even adolescent child fully grasp the concepts of lifelong sterility or a loss of sexual function. The revelations of the WPATH files should have been the end of gender affirming care, but so deeply rooted is this ideology in all of our major institutions that it was always gonna take a lot more. The BBC has yet to report on the WPATH files, which is perhaps to be expected from an organization that has actively contributed to the promotion of gender identity ideology. In one BBC film, a woman is seen telling a group of children that there are over a hundred genders. I have sent five requests to the BBC press office over a period of more than a month to find out why the WPATH files have been ignored. I have yet to receive a response. But for those who are interested, 
I presented a two hour special on the WPATH files on my show, Free Speech Nation on GB News. The link to that show is in the description. The problems do not end with the BBC. Politicians on both sides of the house have been complicit in the spread of gender identity ideology and its destructive consequences. When Liz Truss tabled a debate on her Health and Equality Act Amendment Bill in March, a motion which raised concerns about the social transitioning of children in schools and how private companies are evading the NHS ban on puberty blockers, Labour and Conservative MPs spent four hours filibustering about ferrets <laughs> in order to prevent the discussion. Their ignorance of this ideology has made them its cheerleaders. We should not expect many of these people to admit that they were mistaken. The psychological consequences of accepting that one has been complicit in gay conversion therapy and the medicalization of healthy children is perhaps too much for many to bear. Since details of the CAS review were published, Scottish Green MSP Maggie Chapman, a woman who has criticized biology school textbooks for stating that sex is binary and who has suggested that children as young as eight should be able to transition, she's already decried the contents. Trans healthcare is vital to protecting and supporting the rights and lives of trans people, she posted on X, adding that her party will oppose any moves to increase the age of accessing gender affirming care to 25. Of course, the CAS review makes no such recommendations. Rather, it says that NHS England should establish follow through services for 17 to 25 year olds at each of the regional centres, either by extending the range of the regional children and young people's service or through linked services to ensure continuity of care and support at a potentially vulnerable stage in their journey. This kind of moderate caution is certainly commendable given that the adult brain is not fully developed until the age of 25. Of course, it's too late for some. One detransitioner posted the following on X. Had the recommendations from the CAS review been implemented when I transitioned, in particular, the recommendation of waiting until the age of 25, I would never have transitioned. I grew out of gender dysphoria by the age of 22, but had my genitals amputated by then. Although MPs sought to prevent a debate on the problem of private gender clinics, perhaps the CAS review's criticism of these clinics for pressurizing GPs into prescribing the drugs will change all of that. Not surprisingly, these unscrupulous practitioners are defiant. A statement from Gender GP has vowed to ignore the recommendations of the CAS review and continue with its unevidenced gender affirming approach, according to the WPATH standards of care. The revelations from the WPATH files means nothing to the high priests of this cult. And let's not forget that the current version of the WPATH standards of care includes a chapter on eunuchs, which urges medical practitioners to perform castrations on patients who so identify. Undoing the influence of such pseudoscience is going to be a long and arduous process. The ideas are too entrenched, which explains why even the CAS review has adopted some of the language of the ideology, for example, cisgender or references to sex assigned at birth. Besides, too much is at stake for individuals who have promoted these beliefs. Already commentators like James O'Brien are blaming the toxicity of those who have tried to warn people of the dangers over the last decade. We can expect similar revisionist attempts from others who have failed to speak out and no doubt the culture war will be blamed by those most responsible for waging it. Ultimately, those responsible must be held accountable. Stonewall should finally be driven out of public life. Whereas the charity once fought for gay people, it now actively works against them. There should be an investigation into how it was allowed to maintain its influence in major institutions even after its shift away from gay rights and towards an anti-gay agenda. Any government departments and quangos still associated with Stonewall should sever all ties immediately. Both the Conservatives and Labour ought to ditch their commitment to a ban on trans conversion therapy and recognise that this will effectively stymie the therapeutic efforts of medical practitioners to support gender non-conforming children. Moreover, there should be a ban on private clinics who intend to persist with WPATH guidelines in spite of Dr. Cass's recommendations. Above all, we need to ensure that the well-being of children is never again sacrificed on the altar of ideology. This video was based on an article I wrote for Spiked Online, but most of my articles appear on my Substack a long time before they appear as videos here on Trigonometry. So if you're interested, please do check out my Substack. The link is in the description.